We All Wear Masks, a memoir by Nicholas Gomez. Note to readers, this work is a memoir. It reflects the author's present recollections of his experiences over a period of years. Certain names, locations, and identifying characteristics have been changed. Dialogue and events have been recreated from memory and, in some cases, compressed to convey the substance of what was said or what occurred. Part 1. Day 1. I'm sitting in the passenger seat of Nat's car, crying my eyes out when I realize we're not going to last together. She's trying hard to comfort and understand me, but I can tell we're on opposite ends. She seems to be in shock, and, well, I kind of feel the same way. We're parked at a Burger King outside of Edinburgh, a small town in nowhere, Texas. It is the day after Thanksgiving, and we've just left her parents' place two nights before we were supposed to. I just made us leave her childhood home. Of course she feels alienated and detached from me. Yesterday we celebrated with most of her mom's family, about 50 or so people, all of them native Texans, and I got some racist vibes from a few of her uncles at the dinner table. One of them had been working as a border patrol his whole life. He laughed when I told them I was Mexican. Then another asked if I was religious. I'm not. All but one of them got up from the table after I said that. It was fucking weird, man. Like, middle school bullying kind of weird. Every room I went in after that, if one of the uncles was in that room, they would walk out immediately, no attempt whatsoever to be discreet. And you see, like, I understand it. I may never have been subject to it before that Thanksgiving, and that definitely felt surreal. But I really do understand it. So I told Nat not to worry. Told her it wasn't a big deal and to please not mention it to anyone. I think I even tried to laugh it off with her. She didn't find it funny, but she did promise not to tell anyone about it. Then she told her older sister, Lindsay. Then Lindsay found her parents and told them. Then her mom confronted me and said, I know you're having a hard time settling in at this party, but don't be upset. Nobody's trying to harm you here, I promise. Something about the way she said that just irked me. Like she thought she was better than me, you know? Like she was talking to a five-year-old. Needless to say, I felt way more self-conscious at this party now. Did her uncles know I ratted on them? Who else thought I was having a hard time settling in at the party? I was so in my head that even Nat became an enemy. Well, no, that's not entirely true. She breached my trust, so of course she became my enemy. I hid in the guest room I was sharing with Lindsay's boyfriend until guests started to leave and the party was over. Nat eventually came in and tried to talk to me about feelings and shit. I told her how scared I felt being in a strange home completely by myself. But I'm right here with you, she said, monotone, like she didn't care who I was anymore. Don't you think you're overreacting a little bit? A pause, the kind you'd expect after telling someone you cheated on them. I want to leave in the morning, I said. Go shower, I'm done talking. After her shower, she tried to come around on the matter, tried to understand why I was upset, but really neither one of us was communicating effectively. So we held each other in the dark room, kissed to try and reconnect, then said goodnight. In the morning, both of her parents came into my room before I'd even gotten out of bed. I was under the covers still, wearing only my underwear. I could sense Nat standing behind them, cowering outside the room. Nat told us you aren't feeling very comfortable here, her mom said with a condescending fucking smile on her face. You know my brothers didn't mean anything last night, don't you? Listen, I said through blinding rage. You were kind enough to let me stay the night, and for that I am grateful. But I don't feel safe or comfortable being around you and your family anymore. I don't need to explain myself to you. I'm leaving. I flipped the covers off and started packing in my underwear. Fuck them. If they wanted to look at my half-naked body while I did, who was I to stop them? Gosh, well, we really wish you weren't taking our girl with you, she said. We just think you're being a little unreasonable, don't you think? I got dressed, slipped into my shoes, and told Nat I would wait in the car. As I brushed through her parents to get out of the house, I looked at her dad, the only one who had treated me kindly, and thanked him. But I didn't apologize to either one of them. So now I'm back at the Burger King with Nat, and I just cannot stop crying. I feel scared, the kind of scared I used to feel when I was younger and slept over at friends' houses. I also feel all of a sudden like maybe I am being unreasonable. I mean, how fucking weird would it be if Nat did this to one of my parents? Thing is, that wouldn't happen. And because that wouldn't happen, because what Nat's family did is so far from the baseline humans have agreed upon, I know deep down that it's okay to feel hurt. 
even if Nat doesn't understand it, even if it means we can no longer be together. I swear, it probably takes me an hour to stop crying. It takes me so long that I forget what specific thing I'm crying about. So long that somehow Nat and I get on the same page again. I'm kind of hungry, she says. Do you think eating will help you feel better? Sure, I lie, because I know the only thing that will make me feel better in that moment is to hear Nat validate how I'm feeling. I want so badly for the conflict to go away and for us to have a nice time together. So I lie and let her buy me some chicken nuggets. We eat in the car and try to figure out what our plan for the rest of the day is. I've suggested going back home to Austin. It's a six-hour drive, but honestly, at this point, I don't care. Nat tells me it might be worthwhile to check out South Padre Island. It's about a one-hour drive. So we agree to spend the night on the island and go back to Austin in the morning. We even get excited about our little adventure, having to find a place to stay, exploring somewhere new with her, and just being back on the beach again. I hate sand. I hated it my entire childhood. But being around the ocean, man... It really does ground me. I'm in the driver's seat going over the speed limit on a weirdly unfinished highway. There are so many twists and turns I can no longer tell if we're going east, west, north, or south. I love it. It reminds me of when I moved to Austin and the solo drive down I did all the way from California. That drive was one of the only times I've ever felt genuine confidence in my decisions. I'd just dropped out of college to move thousands of miles away from my family and friends. I'd never been to Austin. I didn't know anyone there either. There was so much that could have gone wrong, so much that should have gone wrong, but none of it was enough to stop me. I'd felt stuck in everyone else's world for so damn long. Going to class, adhering to the dumb fucking uniforms and facial hair policies my high school had, not doing homework and feeling guilty about it, being in a toxic teenage relationship and not knowing why that was, just really feeling like I had none of what I wanted, like I was doing none of the things that sounded fun or interesting to me for 18 fucking years. It's no wonder I get so angry all the time. All of that to say, the drive to South Padre Island brought back some good memories, reminded me of who I wanted to be in life, and why I was where I was. Along with that, it also brought back the realization I'd had just hours ago that Nat and I weren't going to last long together. Not anymore. But I guess if I'm being honest with myself, I knew before we were even a couple that this wasn't a good idea. I figured it out on our third date when she made dinner for me at her place. My brother Todd dropped me off with a six-pack of New Belgium fat tires in hand and the hope that I would get laid. She told me after we ate that she was diagnosed bipolar disorder. I was buzzed enough that it didn't sound all that crazy to me. Besides, if it had, I would have had to leave her apartment and go home. So instead, I asked her about it. I tried to create a safe place for her to open up. As she did, I distinctly remember thinking there was so much worse to deal with than bipolar. So much worse to deal with in my own life. What made me think I could be picky? Besides, maybe I was getting ahead of myself. I mean, this was only our third date, you know? Maybe she wasn't even looking for a boyfriend. Maybe this wasn't meant to be as serious as it felt. When we finished talking, I kissed her. She kissed me back. I put my hands on her face and she wrapped her arms around me. I thought... Holy shit, it's actually going to happen. She pulled me into her bedroom, each of us undressing the other as fast as we could. Her golden curls filled me with the smell of a real woman. Her tight, model-like figure hypnotized me. I frantically touched as much of her body as possible, worried that the opportunity to fuck someone this stunning would slip from my hands any moment like it always did in my dreams. Then she slipped a condom on me and climbed on top of me and wow, all of my worries went away. The whole bipolar thing was flushed from my memory like water down a toilet. It brought with it the illusion of fresh water, a clean slate on which to start this relationship. Looking up at her naked body, watching her ride me, own her sexuality, I knew this was the start of something good. It had to be. Even if everything else failed miserably, I knew being with someone that beautiful would always be enough for me. Also, it didn't hurt that the sex was amazing. When she got tired of riding me, I flipped her onto her chest and fucked her hard like only a real man would. I looked around her room as I did and hoped it would help me last longer. I wanted her to know how well she deserved to be fucked and how grateful I was to be the one doing the fucking. And when I finally came, I couldn't help but think she'd probably been with guys way older than me. Guys who really knew how to fuck. But I don't think I'm really over the whole bipolar thing. And now there's this drama with her family too? Shit just isn't adding up and hasn't been since we started dating. Her friends and I don't get along very well. She doesn't have any interests or hobbies besides cooking. 
and she never cooks outside of school. There's nothing about her specifically that I'm attracted to, but I love her, and she loves me back. I feel good knowing she's a part of my life. I like having someone to care for, someone to do stuff with. Being in a relationship feels so much easier than being alone. The Port Isabel Bridge runs two and a half miles east from 77 to South Padre Island. It is a four-lane highway that reaches a height of 85 feet. It is the only thing connecting the island to Texas. I drive over it, and as the island starts coming into view, I am eerily reminded of a place just like it back home. From afar, it looks like you're about to enter the set of Jersey Shore or the real world. And once you finally cross the bridge, well, it's exactly that. A bunch of hotels, restaurants, bars, and beach clubs. That bridge is usually a traffic jam when the weather's nice, Nat says. So this probably won't be an accurate representation of the beach I'm used to. So, like, lower your expectations. Because it's the end of November, not only is there no traffic jam, the island looks and feels dead all around. Hey, I say. I grew up on the beach. I'm more excited because I'm here with you. She smiles briefly. You can park at Cap and Roy so we can figure out where we're staying. We end up getting a room with complimentary breakfast at the South Padre Island Inn. Then we go back to Captain Roy's for a late lunch. Nat orders the grilled shrimp tacos and I get a grilled chicken sandwich. Almost everything on the menu has the word grilled in there somewhere. So, uh, when's the last time you were on the island? If a lot of my friends are home during school breaks, we almost always make the drive, even if it's just for a night or two. But the last time I was here here was probably two summers ago. What was that like? I worked at Blue Lobster Fish, which doesn't exist anymore, and every day after work, I'd meet up with Lindsay, get drinks, and then just kind of hang out. I smoked a lot of weed back then. No way, I try to sound enthusiastic. Why don't you anymore? That was when I had my first psychotic breakdown. I guess the doctor didn't think it a good idea for me to keep doing drugs, so I stopped. That makes sense. I'm sorry about that. The rest of the meal goes by quietly both of us just eager to be feeling better together. Especially me. I can't stand seeing her this way, feeling like I've made her unhappy in some way. I'm already thinking of ways I can make it up to her. Yes, I'm confused and disoriented as hell right now, but if I can just get Nat to tell me she loves me the way she says it when we're not tense with each other, I think if I get that from her, then everything else will be okay. So we leave Cap and Roy's to buy drinks and snacks at the only grocery store that's open. There are glimpses of the usual us as we travel the aisles, being playful with each other and trying to make small decisions, like what kind of beer to get, and whether or not I should indulge in my chocolate addiction. And then back at the motel, it all goes away again. I don't feel super well right now, she says. Maybe drinking isn't the best idea for me, but you can drink. I don't mind. Drinking alone never felt right to me. What's going on? What doesn't feel good? I think I might be getting my period soon. There are all of these obstacles in the way of us reconnecting, but I find them exciting to navigate. I'm good at solving other people's problems. I get off on taking care of others, women especially, so I sit with Nat and comfort her. I know it's been a weird couple of days, I start, and I know last night, this morning, none of it was good. I'm not happy about any of it either, but I do really love you, you know, and I think in time we'll figure this all out together. Because this is special. You're special. And I'm sorry if you're not feeling that way right now. Some tears form in her eyes, so I keep going. If we could just try and have a fun time tonight, then maybe we can have a fun time tomorrow. And then maybe the day after that. We just need to take it one day at a time and focus on the things we love about each other. Everyone has shit they need to deal with. I'm no different. She hugs me tightly and cries into my shoulder. It's okay. I run my hand through her golden curls, reminded of the first time we had sex. It's okay. My other hand rubs her back. I'm sorry. She lifts her head up and presses her lips against mine. I've gotten through to her. She's here with me now, finally. She does miss me. I kiss her neck and then her chest. I suck on her nipples and look up to tell her I love her. Her eyes are closed, teeth biting into her bottom lip. I keep going down, kissing as much of her body as I can. Now my hands are reaching up as I lick the inside of her thighs. She knows what's coming. I can feel it in her legs and how they shake uncontrollably every five seconds. She still thinks of me this way. She still trusts me to be gentle with her. She still believes we can be intimate. She still cares about our relationship. 
She still loves me. She still wants me. And feeling wanted is all I need right now. All right, so that was the end of day one, chapter one. And what I'm going to be doing for context is as I re-listen to every day, every chapter, I'm going to be answering some of the questions that come up for me and in an attempt to answer some of the questions that might come up for you as a reader and as a listener. And I'm also just going to be diving a little bit deeper into some of the topics uh, in each chapter and in each day. So for this particular day one, uh, some of the stuff that came up was, you know, when I, I said that when I drove down to college, it was one of the times I felt the most confidence in my decisions. And that still rings true to me even a year and a half after I wrote that. Um, and part, I think the reason for that is that I think every high school student or college student even, or if you want to take it further, I think people who have just recently graduated college, sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we have gone from grade school to middle school to high school to college and then straight into a professional work environment. And so we never really, uh, I don't want to say test ourselves because I think those institutions are a test. Uh, but I think when I was driving down from California to Austin, I had made the decision to drop out of college, which was at the time the biggest decision I had made in my life. No doubt about it. And it, there was a lot of uncertainty and there was a lot of risk associated with me making that decision. My parents didn't approve. My parents were worried for me. They had all of all of my fears. My parents probably felt exponentially more afraid than I did. But it's I, I that is something that we that we have to do for ourselves at some point in our lives. Because otherwise we can carry that frustration from institution to institution and sort of begin to feel like what is the meaning of my life what is the purpose if all that i'm doing is following rules and you know i i'm getting good grades and now i'm getting good uh, feedback from my bosses and i think it is important that we before we strive for that financial success or that financial stability, which is an illusion, if you ask me. I think before we make that our goal, we need to make taking a risk our goal. And because otherwise we're acting out of fear and we're living our life, our lives out of fear. And that's how you end up in a place where a year, two years, five years down the line, you regret where you are because the only reason you're there is because you were afraid to try something else. And now I'm not saying trying something else has to be throwing everything away and starting from scratch, but it could just look like, okay, I've graduated college and I still don't really have um, a lot of responsibility, right? Um, and so I'm going to take a year to travel and just, you know, maybe I don't, maybe I don't necessarily want to live where I went to college. And if that's not where I want to live, then what are my other options, right? For most of us, that's either where we grew up or wherever our parents now live. And so at most, you're looking at three places in the entire world, which for me were either Cancun, Mexico where I grew up, San Francisco, where my mom currently lives, or where I went to college, which was Ventura, California. And I didn't choose either one of those, not, uh, any of those three places. I went to Ventura for college because that's where I got in. 
I, my mom will move to San Francisco because she had some friends she knew that lived there. And I grew up in Cancun, Mexico, because that was where my parents decided that we were going to, you know, start a family. So who's to say that any of those three places are the right place for me to live? Um, I think that a lot of people don't really take the time to make this decision to take stock for what are my traits and which place is best suited for that. You know, maybe you grew up in Cancun like me, but you hate the weather. And so you you like the cold and you want to move to Canada. But, you know, where in Canada? Well, I don't know. Maybe you're very interested in finding a romantic partner. And if you're a guy, then I'm sure there are cities where there are more women than men or where at least the ratio is sort of balanced out, right? And so I think that it's very important that we think about these things before we build the illusion of stability and um, security. Because I hear a lot of my male friends who are my age and are in these office jobs talk about security, but I, I, I question sometimes what they're really, what they really feel secure from. And I think the answer for a lot of us is risk and uncertainty, which is where oftentimes we find the most reward in life. So that's one of the things that came up for me. The second thing is that, and, and, I, and it's two questions that I think can be answered together. The first one is, why? what is it about, uh, you know, these conversations that I have um, with Nat specifically in this chapter where she told me about her bipolar and why why does that not strike me as it would perhaps um, other individuals, you know, as a red flag? Why is it something that to me feels like a good thing that this is happening, that I'm being given this information. And the second question is, why does being in a relationship feel easier than being alone? And so I think to answer the first question, you know, growing up, my my mother confided in me a lot. And most of the time, it was uh, regarding my dad and either how much money he owed her, how he was screwing her over their business that they had built together, um, you know, just just stuff that at, at 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, no child should be hearing from their parent. But it felt like, okay, well, these were the only times that I was engaging with my mother emotionally and having, you know, that intimate connection on one-on-one -on -one time. And so now that 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 behavior has stuck with me and obviously it's something that I have changed and that I am continuing to change, but it it unconsciously or subconsciously it it takes me back to that place where I was with my mother and she was uh, confiding in me and so it feels to me like it's this is what love is, you know. Um, the the darker and the heavier your secrets get, the more that must mean that you trust me and that you love me. And 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 that is again to lead into the second question. That's why being in a relationship feels easier than being alone, is because if I can focus on this other person's heavy secrets or issues they are dealing with emotional physical, whatever they may be, then that allows me not to focus on my own. And a lot of men my age, a lot of young men, even in high school, they they don't really know that they have the option to not go straight into a relationship. But they fear being alone or they fear saying what they really want when they meet someone because well what happens if that person doesn't like what you have said and they decide they don't want to see you any longer well then you have to confront your emotions and you have to feel 
uh, whether that's rejected or lonely or abandonment, you know, these are things that will come up. And so even in those situations, we use that person as uh, some of us, obviously, we, we use that person to avoid going internal with ourselves. And, you know, so many, so, so many of my male friends, they, they don't really put any thought into this. You know, I, I don't, I don't consider that I behave very differently, as far as uh, the decision making, but, but I try to be aware of, okay, is this person, you know, somebody that I, that I genuinely want to be with because of that individual person? And what are those things about her that make me want to be with her? Or am I just afraid of spending time by myself? And most of the time, it is the latter. Um, so just some things to think about. Um, and, and to look forward to some more of these questions. So thank you for listening. Day 186. My therapy session starts. Alex sits across from me looking stunning as ever. I chose her as my therapist because I thought she was the most beautiful of them all. All the others were old, gray-haired women that looked like they could be friends with my mom. I've been coming to Alex for a couple of months now. I haven't noticed much of a change in my life, except that I've broken up with Nat and quit my job in a span of two weeks. I basically pulled the rug out from under my own feet and let myself fall head first. It's all felt pretty terrible. I've felt terrible, like there's a huge void in my day-to-day -day that needs filling. When I'm not looking for jobs, it seems like all I'm doing is self-harm. I don't mean like cutting my arms or trying to hurt myself physically. That stuff scares the shit out of me. I'm talking about going out to get drunk, smoking a lot of weed, and sleeping around with strangers. The only constant in my life right now has been the mixed martial arts gym I've been going to. I swear, as soon as I wrap my arms and strap my gloves, I become a completely different person. Rage becomes acceptable. Controlled rage, that is. Being violent is the goal. I get to punch and kick the shit out of grown men and women. I get to release all of this pent-up anger and frustration when I'm in there sweating my ass off. It sucks because once I'm done with class, I go back to my isolated fucking life. It doesn't even take a full hour before I'm thinking of crazy shit I can do that night to get some kind of adrenaline rush, to feel excited. I tell Alex about it all, the rage I feel, the deep sadness and how overwhelming it's been. She nods her head and tries to make me feel good about the negatives. Anytime I allow myself to be truly open with her, I immediately feel regret. And I think I feel that because deep down I fantasize about fucking her. I fantasize about what it would be like if she and I shared feelings for each other. That's how damn lonely I felt without Nat. Or maybe it's just natural and I'm trying to fight it because of the sexual shame I carry. Who the fuck knows, really? Anyway, I tell Alex everything. No, not everything. I tell her what I feel comfortable sharing. All the filler bullshit I know is a part of the problem, but not the root of it. I tell myself that it's still progress, even though I feel like I've plateaued. See, there's this part of me that really wants to figure out how to live a meaningful life. I have role models that are all advocates for being healthy in every aspect of day-to-day -day living. Whether that means the food you eat or the people you surround yourself with, through my role models, I've formed the belief that if I ever want to be a good partner, a good father, I have a long way to go full of emotional growth hurdles. And well, fuck, I just know I'm not putting in the work. All I'm really using therapy for is confession. It's kind of fucking annoying to me, so I can imagine Alex isn't too happy about it either, if she's even noticed. I'm like the worst possible patient she could have. I tell most of the truth, but don't do anything to improve the awful situations I keep putting myself in. But I continue to show up every Sunday at noon. It takes me an hour and two buses to get to her office. It's the only sliver of hope, because here, I'm forced to at least hear the truth, even when I don't listen. So I continue to show up. After our session, I head for the bus stop, and right away I pull out my phone. My arms are jittery because I've been waiting for therapy to end so I could check my fake email account. Someone is awaiting my reply. His name is Jack, and we've been emailing back and forth since last night. I email Jack that I'll be arriving in the next 15 to 20 minutes. He emails me back with instructions on what to do as soon as I arrive. I'm on the bus now, headed south, thinking, what if I don't get off? I can just as easily go home and use my time for something else. This is a stranger we're talking about. I don't owe him anything. So I pull out my phone and find an online coin flip generator. 
Two out of three, I tell myself. Tails, I stay on the bus. Heads, I go through with it. Heads. Heads. Fuck it. A few more flips. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Heads. Heads. I continue to flip coins until I arrive at the stop outside Jack's apartment complex. Who am I kidding? I was never going to stay on the bus. I email him that I'm here and he emails back. I'll be down in a sec. Five minutes later, I see Jack as he approaches the door. My body feels cold and nervous. I enter the building and follow him to the elevators. They're being remodeled but are still operational somehow. The one we get in is covered by a tarp. The famous Greenwood Towers, Jack says. This is my first time hearing his voice. Inside his apartment are a bedroom and bathroom, a large living room, and a small kitchen. Your standard college setup. It's also cluttered as fuck. I don't know what your style is, he says. If you're a couch or bed kind of guy, you pick. I'll be right there. I make a ride into his bedroom and watch from there as he pours himself a shot of tequila, drinks it, and then pours another one after that. Then he walks towards me and starts to unbuckle. I get on my knees and help to undress him. In the picture he sent last night, his cock looked to be seven or eight inches. When I pull his underwear down, it looks more like three or four. I'm disappointed, but not for long because once it's in my mouth, it grows exponentially. A cat sneaks into the bedroom and starts meowing by my side. Jack pulls out and shoes the cat. Then he closes the door and props a shoe against it to keep it from opening on its own. His cock grows even more the second time it enters my mouth until soon enough he's gagging me with it. I can tell from the way he moves that he does this often. Here, he says, we're working at an angle. Why don't you get on the bed and lie on your back? I do what he asks, my head hanging from the edge of the bed, and open my mouth again. He goes inside, only this time he's able to fit all eight and a half inches down my throat. That's better, he says. Ten minutes pass. He lets me breathe for a moment, his hands still holding the back of my head, and says, I'm going to get really close, and then I want you to put it in as deep as you can, okay? I nod, even though seconds earlier when he asked where I wanted him to come, I told him anywhere but my mouth. But what was I supposed to do? Say no? I watch him masturbate for a full minute, awaiting his signal. When he finally gives it, I open my mouth and let him force his cock deep inside it, as deep as he wants, his cum hitting the back of my throat. I cough immediately, choking, and pull him out. The warm, salty taste in my mouth makes me gag. I'm not going to make it to the bathroom soon enough, so instead I just open my mouth and let it all wash down on his bed covers. He laughs as he apologizes, says, That was a lot, wasn't it? Not because I want to, but because I'm ready to leave. I smile and nod my head. When he sees the mess I've made, he says, Aw oh, man, looks like I have to do laundry all day now. Very little things are thrown my way as I get dressed and leave his apartment. Empty. It's a word I keep coming back to. Every time I do this, I feel empty. Not during, or before, just after. So I exit the building and decide to walk for a while. I need to clear my head and get some fucking sunlight in my life. Day 9 Over a week has gone by since Thanksgiving and I'm still dealing with shrapnel left over from the party. I talked to a couple of close friends about it, and every one of them said the same thing. Damn, that's messed up. You should write a story about it, even though I think they're right about it making a good story. It's not what I wanted to hear from them, so I talked to my mom about it. She tells me she's sorry that it happened that way, and that writing a story might help me process some of my feelings, primarily my anger. When I was younger, I used to get so angry I would threaten my siblings with physical violence. Now my mom can't stop worrying about that side of me, but that's not what I want to hear either. In fact... I don't need to hear anything. All I want is to be heard, listened to, and it seems like that's no longer something people can do for me. So I suffocate my mind with confused thoughts. I get a back and forth going about whether or not I should call it off with Nat. I'm never going to her family's place again, I tell myself. So how can I genuinely believe there's still a chance for us? Well, hold up, the other voice says. What about all of your favorite stories? Nobody has it all. Some people, all they need to be happy is each other. If it's worked for someone before, there's no reason it can't work for you. Nat is spending the night at my place. My blackout curtains are down already. Computer shut off. We've eaten dinner. Pretty much everything that gets done before bed has been done already. Except I'm sitting on the toilet constipated as hell. I'm in there for so long that Nat decides to call her mom. I realize this not because I hear Nat's voice, but because I hear her mom on speaker. Are you with him right now? She asks. Yeah, he's in the bathroom. You know, honey... I just don't think you need to be with someone who disrespects your family the way he did. But mom, you weren't very nice to him either. You... 
I wasn't nice to him. He didn't thank me or your father. He was scared. I mean, he didn't feel com comfortable. You know who else didn't feel comfortable? Me. I walk out of the bathroom. Your boyfriend came to my house, and just because he's not good talking to people, because of how he grew up, he acted like a child around your family and treated everyone with contempt. Nat nods her head and shuts down. I'm overwhelmed with intense fear. Panic starts to settle in my bones. Problem solving is out the window. I'm back to when I was 10 years old and fighting my sister Juliana for the computer, aiming a child-sized bow and arrow at her chest so that she'll leave me the hell alone. I'm so fucking pissed I'm nodding along with Nat and making all kinds of faces. Her mom rants for another minute before Nat tells her she has to go. No part of me is thinking about how that conversation affects Nat. All I care about right now is self-preservation. I'm sorry you had to hear that, she says. But how can I take her seriously when she was the one who put the call on speaker? Why'd you do that? Do what? You know what? Call my mom? I exhale loudly. Nat looks confused and on edge. Did you have to put her on speaker? No one made you do that. So why would I believe you're sorry? What do you mean? You were in the bathroom. I just wanted to lie down and not have the phone right next to my ear. What about when I came out? You weren't lying down then. Why are you mad right now? Why am I mad? Are you kidding? I see nervousness in her eyes now, but it's not really me that's talking anymore. Because your cunt mom just said some mean fucking shit about me. Nat starts to cry and put her stuff away. Oh, you're just going to leave? Is that it? I'm sorry, okay? Her face is red and it makes me wonder what color mine must be. I'm sorry that you heard that. I really am. My mom can get like that sometimes, but that doesn't mean you get to yell at me. Her words land like a dagger to my heart. They help me realize where I am and why I'm so angry. She's so right I almost wish she would slap me so I can be right instead. But I know she won't. I know this is one of those moments where composure is all that mattered, and I gave mine up. The word sorry pops into my head and starts to form on my lips. I'm... uh... I stammer. You're right. And I'm sorry. As soon as the word leaves my mouth, I start sobbing uncontrollably. Shame conquers me. I've been bad and now I need to be punished for it. I don't know how to make mistakes. Nat comes over to me and says, It's okay that you're angry. Just talk to me. I never learned how to be a child. I don't know what letting myself be taken care of looks like. I was forced to adapt and in doing so learned how to take care of another. It's easy for me to comfort Nat when she needs me, but when I need her, I flash back to the times my mom would yell at me and send me to my room with no explanations as to why, other than me being bad. You can cry as loud as you want for as long as you want, she'd say, but don't come out until you realize what you've done. I look at Nat with deep hurt in my eyes, unsure now of where the pain is coming from. I want so badly to move through this interaction in a healthy way, but I keep flashing back to thoughts I had when I was in my room, locked away for being bad. Crying out for help feels alienating. Needing someone else when I'm supposed to know all of the answers is wrong. I wipe my tears with my shirt and slowly stop crying. I reach for Nat's hand and kiss the top of it. I'm just feeling kind of insecure and embarrassed, I tell her. I love you. I love you too. We kiss. My cock gets hard instantly because it has no emotions. We undress. The blood flushes from my face and I get lightheaded. We lie in bed naked. Nat touches me fast all over the place. She brings me inside her. I allow a moment of true intimacy. Then the void comes back and reminds me to be miserable. None of my feelings go away, and this is about as close to her as I'll ever be. But I do my best to shove it all down. I do my best to ignore reason and emotion. And despite my best efforts to tell myself otherwise, I realize I'm also practicing being distant from her. Day 30. My mom and my sister, Juliana, are in town. While I'm at work, I text Todd, my brother, and ask what the plans are for dinner. Thirty minutes later, I still haven't heard from him. He must still be asleep at the apartment. I text my mom and ask her the same thing. She texts back about some place her and Juliana are shopping at. Juliana's going to a massage after that, but mom says we'll all meet up at their hotel and decide on dinner after. The whole thing seems unorganized and like an afterthought. As I leave work, I text her back that I'll be late to the hotel because I've decided to go to kickboxing class. I honestly want to stay away from my family as much as I can because aside from Todd, I just don't feel much of a connection with them anymore. And the fact that all they want to do is shop and get massages when we haven't seen each other in a little over a year irks the hell out of me. It's like they don't really care about my life here or getting to know the city as their son sees it. 
So I guess a part of me keeps expecting things to change, you know? Because I was excited when they told me they were visiting, but I couldn't really tell you why now. Maybe I saw things going differently, even though that's never been the case. Spending time with them has only ever made me sad and lonely and insecure. And I must not be over those feelings because I stop texting my mom when she asks if I'm okay. When I finally get back to her, I tell her that I'm not. That if my sister can get a massage and be late, I can go to class and be late. But making a last minute call to go to the gym before dinner doesn't sit well with her. She texts back. We came to Austin and spent a whole evening dedicated to meeting your girlfriend. And you can't even do this for us? Reading that helps me understand a little better where my nice guy tendencies come from and why it's so easy for me to build resentment with people. It also throws me back to another time this happened. I was at my mom's place in the Bay Area. My girlfriend had just left to go back to Mexico after a week-long trip here. Mom had friends over that evening. My brother and I didn't leave our rooms until her friends left the house. Not because we didn't like them, but because they were her friends. We didn't realize we were supposed to entertain them until our mom came and yelled at us. This is what she said to me, almost verbatim. You're a selfish person, Nick. I just spent all of last week driving you and your girlfriend around, taking you to museums, making dinner for you, and you can't even do this one thing for me? I wonder how far back the resentment goes with her. Does she resent the fact that giving birth to me didn't help to fix her marriage? I reread her text and then brush it off. She doesn't know me, I think, and even if I am going just to spite them, they don't care about me. All they care about is making sure we go somewhere fancy for dinner so we can take a fake-ass picture with fake-ass smiles on our faces. Then everyone can see just how happy our family really is. But it's all horseshit. Part of the reason I'm living in Austin is because I want to get as far away from my family as possible. I only let Todd follow me here because he and I are closer than the rest. Everyone else just feels suffocating. When I get home, I draft a text for Nat about the situation. I delete the damn thing without sending it, though, because I remember that she's back home with her psycho mom. I don't need to give that religious nut any more ammo. Instead, I bottle it all up. I have weed in my desk that could easily make the thoughts go away, but then I'd be high for dinner, and I know that would guarantee disaster. So I start to resent the fact that I can't smoke because of them. All I want right now is to get high and listen to music, or go on a walk until the freezing cold numbs my body. I don't even sign up for kickboxing because I'm too much of a pussy to do what I actually want to do. I'm just kind of stuck at home watching videos until it's time to meet up with them. Where we go for dinner is exactly where I expect us to. It's a two-story, dim-lit, house-turned restaurant on Rainy Street. I can tell by the way the hostess greets us that the food here is expensive and served in small portions. There are candles at each table, which, given how dead the place is, make me feel like I'm mourning. Everyone orders drinks and food while I sit in silence thinking about all things stressful. Thanksgiving is still on my mind, more so now because my whole family knows what happened and I can tell they don't believe my side of it. They think that because of my behavior growing up, I must have done something to deserve it. I'm also thinking about all the shit they don't know about me and how I feel unable to share any of it with them. Ever. Nobody knows the real me. I can picture all my friends and coworkers being whatever about it, you know? But my family? I can't even share my poetry without them thinking I'm going to kill myself, so, uh, yeah, I feel no qualms about keeping other secrets from them. Throughout dinner, I just sit there and kind of stare at everyone, not really listening because I'm not interested in engaging with anyone. Juliana and Todd try to laugh and keep dinner friendly, but at the same time, all three of them keep asking me what's wrong and why am I being so quiet. I'm fine, I lie. I'm just not very hungry. So you're not going to eat anything, Mom asks? And I don't respond because literally every thought I am having is about how fucking angry I am at her and everyone else in my family. I'm quiet and fronting like I have no cares in the world. But inside I'm boiling with sadness and rage. I put up with everyone for damn near 18 years. Don't I get a break now? Don't I get to run away and start my own family? There's just no way in hell I want these people around for the rest of my life. No shot. The amount of narcissism at the table gets to be too much too soon. So mom picks up the check, and we all walk back to Todd's Prius. I sit passenger to him, and the girls sit in the back. Nobody is talking. There's a tension so sharp in the air that we can all hear each other breathing. Then suddenly mom starts crying. Then she starts yelling at me. What's wrong with you, she says. Why are you doing this to me? I've been trying to keep my cool, but you're acting like a spoiled brat, and I don't know if I should be worried or angry at you. Todd pulls over. Angry at me? Really? I pause because, boy, am I about to lose control. This isn't about you, Mom. 
It's not always about you. Stop being so goddamn selfish all the time. Then I get out of the car, slam the door shut, and walk away into the cold winter night, thinking all the while about the weed I have back at the apartment and how I can't wait to get home so I can smoke and get high, high, high. So again, if you're just tuning in, I am doing these post-chapter, post-day questions slash topics that I'll be answering. Just stuff that has come up for me as I re-listen to each chapter or things that I think I didn't give enough uh, detail or go into enough enough depth with. So for day 30, one of the questions that I, one of the things I think I didn't go into enough detail was these nice guy tendencies of mine and what I really mean by that term. There's a great book on nice guy syndrome that's called No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. And what it, what it means for me is that, you know, a lot of us think we're nice people and I, I don't think that I'm, uh, I don't think that I'm the opposite of nice, but I think that sometimes I use nice to mask other behaviors. And generally that looks like wants and needs that I am not getting met. And so I mask those wants and needs by pretending that I am nice, you know? So it's like, Whenever somebody asks if you can help them with something, say, taking care of their dog, if you don't really want to, but you're only doing it because you don't want them to think that you're an asshole or that you're not a nice person, that is a nice guy tendency because that brews resentment and it's not a straightforward uh, way of uh acting in a relationship you know it's you're not being honest because the truth is you don't want to and now obviously there are exceptions you know nobody wants to pick up their friend from the airport at midnight but sometimes you know if you invited that friend to come and visit you then you, you got to do it uh, so there are exceptions to the case but so growing up, that was sort of how my family operated, was my dad would let me borrow the car, and I could then go do whatever I wanted. But the next morning, if I wasn't up at 7 in the morning to help him do yard work or to water the plants or whatever, then he would say, next time you want to use the car, I'm not going to let you. If you don't help me, I'm not going to help you. That's basically what nice guy syndrome boils down to. And so it's important, you know, just to be aware of when we're saying yes, why are we saying yes? Is there a hidden motivation behind that? If not, then you're probably fine, you know. The second thing, which is related to nice guy tendencies, that I think I didn't go into enough depth with, is why might my mom resent me for not fixing her relationship and her marriage or saving it might be a better word i don't really go into detail in this chapter on that because um doesn't matter why but if you're if you're curious you know the the so i i was born four years after my brother who was born two years after my sister right so there's a six-year gap between my sister and I and a four-year gap between my brother and I, which means my parents had one kid, they waited two years, they had another one, and then they waited four years to have me. And so in, in the process of publishing this book, as I was uh, having conversations with my mom about the book and about my childhood and about her relationship to my dad, she told me that my dad had already cheated on my mom uh, a number of times. You know, she didn't tell me how many, but and and, and this was a th a thing in their relationship already that they were trying to work through, and it's, it wasn't working. You know, for 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 a while it wasn't working, and so I was this sort of last 
attempt at fixing that that broken trust and that failed relationship was you know you have seen it in a lot of movies is let's have another kid and maybe that'll fix things because we'll have something to distract ourselves with or i don't really know i mean i i can't even rationally wrap my head around why people might think that that would fix the relationship to me it just seems like it would complicate things but all that aside you know people do make these decisions decisions and so they had me and then my dad continued to cheat their relationship just worsened and now there was this reminder of yet another mistake and of a time in my mother's life and my parent my dad's life where they were emotionally going through a very 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 difficult time and it it what they thought might work didn't work and i was a product of that um not working right so it's like a reflection of themselves almost it's like you didn't fix our relationship so that must mean that you are a failure or that we are a failure and and you remind us of that uh and and i don't you know this might be to varying degrees i can't speak for my mother on this topic but or my father but i know for sure that there is um there is a lot of resentment from my parents to, toward me because because of this um and it is also one of the reasons that i sort of have i've I've struggled with low self-esteem my whole life is because deep down i see myself as this failure to fix their relationship even though that was never uh even though they never told me that explicitly i you know as a as a child you infer these things and you can see your parents how they behave towards you my dad never being around my mom being sad all the time and me being alone and you know you you make connections um so that's the end for questions and topics for day 30 and again thanks for listening day 45 the new year comes and brings with it friendship and adventure it also puts distance between me and my mom who i haven't talked to since our christmas eve dinner distance i'm more than okay with it's a kind of distance that helps keep my family out of sight and out of mind. And I think as long as they're not constantly on my mind, what does it matter how fucked up our relationships are? I'd rather be focused on people that actually care about me and not just themselves. So I find myself in the back seat of a light blue Mitsubishi Galant, sitting next to this dude I just met named Evan. My coworker Penny rides passenger to her boyfriend Ben. We're on our way to camp at Brazos Bend State Park for two nights. Riding in the back with the windows down, Eminem blasting on the car stereo, I feel for the first time like maybe I've met some real friends in Texas. I say real because I've met plenty of people in Austin, but I never make plans with them outside of the context of where we met. I hang out with all different kinds of people at all different kinds of places, like the improv theater downtown or the mixed martial arts gym I train at, but when I'm home alone, there's no one I can call to grab a drink or go to a movie with. But now there's Penny and her boyfriend and, who knows, maybe this dude Evan will turn out to be cooler than he seems. Besides, we're sharing a one-person tent and are both six feet plus. We'll definitely get to know each other. Night falls after we set up the tent and unload our stuff. We use the pit next to our station to start a fire and cook with, and also to stay warm because it's cold as fuck in January. Dinner comes out looking like a year-old pot of rice and beans. Penny calls it chum, and we all laugh at that. Then we smoke a bowl, and chum doesn't taste so bad anymore. It still looks like moldy mud, but I'm high, so who really cares, you know? I'm eating off of a disposable plate and drinking beer instead of water because that's what everyone else is doing. My feet are resting on the brick pit, warmer than they've felt all day. So warm, in fact, that after a while I start to wonder if I'm burning them. But I'm high, and my body is cemented into place, so I figure what the hell. If it doesn't hurt yet, it must not be that bad. So, uh, Nick, Ben says. Penny told me you do improv? What? No way, Evan adds. Yeah, I'm taking classes right now. It's fun. Classes? Like, what kind of classes? Well, they split them into six levels, so each level runs about six weeks, and you just sort of graduate from one to the next if you want to keep going. Have you ever done any improv? I wish. 
It sounds so fun. When I was younger, me and my friends would make movies and skits all the time, Ben says. Then to Penny. I kind of miss it. Penny encourages him, says, You should sign up for one of Nick's classes. They're like 200 bucks, but you can get them half off if you help out around the theater, which is a great way to meet people, so really it's only a hundy. But, so, like, what do they teach you exactly? Because I feel like I already know how to improvise. I laugh because I've been there. I say, You do. I think deep down everyone has the muscle, but what the classes do is teach you more about the muscle, show you different muscles, and also help you exercise them frequently. Like, when I signed up, I thought I was a pretty funny dude, you know? But when you're paired with a woman in her 40s for a scene at a park bench, you can't be cracking the same kind of jokes you would with your buddies back home. Evan chuckles. Ben looks like he wants me to continue, so I do. It's also not just about improv. I actually didn't even sign up because of the improv. I signed up because my whole life, I felt like there's a voice in my head telling me I can't do things that I want to do, that I'm not good enough, or social enough, or yada yada yada. And when you're up there doing a scene or playing a game, it's all about focusing on what's in front of you, listening to your scene partners and not the voice in your head that keeps trying to convince you of how stupid every idea you have is. Eventually I stop talking because I'm stoned and the voice in my head is stronger when I'm high. It tells me I'm not making sense anymore, or that I'm rambling or boring the hell out of everyone. So after a while I just get real quiet and start listening instead. And soon after that Penny announces that she's going to bed, which means Ben is doing the same, which means Evan and I are also. Also, Penny tells me, if it's too uncomfortable in Evan's tent, we have plenty of room for one more in ours. I thank her and wonder if I would have done the same thing had it been Nat and I in the tent. Then Evan and I squeeze into his tent, our ass cheeks pressed against each other, and somehow we find sleep. Brazos Bend State Park has 37 miles of trails. The marshy landscape reminds me of what I picture Louisiana to be like. Alligators roam freely, all of the trees are dormant, the sky is an overcast gray. As we walk down miles and miles of dirt trail, I stay a few steps behind my friends, thinking of Nat and how fucking bad I still feel for leaving her behind yesterday. I guess I hadn't told her about the trip, so when I finally did, only hours before Penny picked me up, she freaked out. Her anxiety kicked into full gear. She panicked. The only reason she didn't cry was because of how fucking spooked she was. See, the way Nat describes it is that whenever something triggers these responses in her, she's no longer in control. A bunch of different people start yammering in her head about shit that isn't even relevant. Like, she thought I hadn't told her because I didn't want her to come with. She thought I didn't want to be with her anymore because I always tell her these things. Two nights is so long. How will I make it through? My first instinct was to reassure her that everything would be alright, even though I knew it wouldn't be. Not because of the trip, just because our shit had gotten so unbelievably crazy, I was shocked we were still together. When that didn't work, I became frustrated. The emotional approach didn't work, so logic had to be the only other option. What's so wrong with me wanting to go camp with a couple of friends? I started to believe that it wasn't her anxiety acting up, it was her insecurities. She was being possessive and immature. Then my ride arrived. Penny and Ben and Evan and this trip, which was supposed to be super fucking exciting, waited for me outside. I have to go, I told her. I love you. I'm sorry. It's going to be alright. She stormed off to her car. I tried not to look too sullen as I got in the Mitsubishi. But deep down I was as freaked out as Nat. I was just better at choking my feelings till they passed out for a while. Now it all comes back up on the trail. I want to go back to the tent and cry. I want to be alone. Even though being alone never makes me feel better, it's always what I seek out. I think, fuck, I don't want to have to explain to everyone what's going on. I'm ashamed of what's going on. I'm so afraid to not look put together all the time that I isolate myself from those who care the most. I tell myself no one can know about my flaws. Penny falls back and asks me if I'm doing alright. The truth pours out of me involuntarily. I regret everything I say seconds after it leaves my mouth, and Penny just listens. Then Ben and Evan listen, until the three of them are walking by my side, hearing me tell them about Nat's panic attack and how weak I feel for not being able to go a day without her. But you have, Penny says. It's almost been a full day since we picked you up and you're still here with us. Yeah, don't worry about us, she adds. I mean, obviously we wish you weren't feeling this way, but you're not doing as bad as you may feel. Chin up, friend. We love you. I'm glad it's out in the open, but still, I only feel sadder from it more in my head than I was before. Their perception of who I am is no longer in my control. 
They know the truth. They know how attached Nat and I are and how bad this relationship is for both of us. Even if they're not saying it, I can tell they wish I wasn't here. Or maybe that's the voice in my head. Fuck, man. Being vulnerable sucks. I'm woken up by rain. Not the sound of it. The dripping of it from the leaves of a tree that I've tied my hammock to. They sprinkle my face gently and wake me up like a soothing alarm tone. I don't feel panic or worry about the rain and the fact that I'm lying on what is now going to act as a water collector. Then I realize I'm still high from all the weed we smoked before bed. I reach for my comforter on the grass and bring it over as much of the hammock as possible. It is so thick that I can't feel the rain anymore. And though I know it'll seep through in time if the rain doesn't stop, for now, I'm balled up under it, safe, cozier than a joey in his mother's furry pouch. Day 51 There's a book release and signing at Austin's biggest bookstore, Book People, tonight. J.T. McCormick, the CEO of a company I'm a big fan of, is releasing a memoir about his struggles with abuse and becoming a self-made man, titled I Got There. His co-author, Tucker Max, is also the co-founder of said company, Book in a Box, and has single-handedly affected my life more than anyone I know. Needless to say, I'm going to be there. I already pre-ordered my copy of the book. That's what they charge nowadays to go to these things. It's a great way to sell hardcovers in a world where print is slowly becoming obsolete. I'm going to the signing with Nat. It's all I've been thinking about today. Almost a year and a half after moving to Austin and it's finally happening. Tonight I get to meet the man, the myth, the legend, Tucker Max. I know it sounds like I'm in love with this dude, or obsessed or whatever, and I'm not saying I'm not, but there's more to the story, see. I read his books when I was a senior in high school. I found comfort in his voice, his ability to be completely honest with the reader. He's also funny as hell. I remember after I finished his first book how I kept telling myself I'd finally found someone who just gets it, you know? He still had flaws and was far from a role model, but the kind of smarts he had were exactly the kind of smarts I wanted. I wanted to learn how to miss an entire semester of college and still pass my exams. I'd been doing it in high school, but college seemed like a whole different ball game. Then I went off to college and kind of forgot about him for a while. I didn't want to go to college, but I didn't know what else to do, so I listened to my parents and did what they thought was best for me. I put down my lifelong goal of becoming a professional poker player when they called it a pipe dream and focused only on school. College wasn't a joke and my old friends weren't going to be there for me to cheat off of. The first semester was pretty dope, I won't lie. It hurts me to say it because I hate those institutions so damn much, but it was. I took a screenwriting class and a bunch of filler ones to hit enough credits. Poker was on hold, but there I was, studying film in a university outside of LA, making new friends and smoking tons and tons of weed. All that it was, really, was fun. Ventura County became my new home. When I came back from winter break, though, I happened upon a podcast hosted by none other than Tucker Max. It was called The Mating Grounds. I wasn't in a dark place, per se, but I knew there was so much more I could be doing with my time. College was fun, sure, but it wasn't much different than high school. All it was was ten times more expensive, everyone just as immature and full of themselves, including me. So when I started listening to The Mating Grounds and learning about myself in ways I never had before, I realized how wrong it was to spend $20,000 plus a year on self-growth when I could be doing it for free with the podcast. I learned about evolutionary psychology and toxic relationships. I learned about men and women on a deep level. I started to question why none of this was taught to me growing up. Why did I spend so much fucking time learning about the Mexican independence instead of this? Why didn't my parents ever tell me that I could channel my anger through kickboxing and jujitsu? Why was I so afraid throughout high school to break up with my girlfriend? Why did I feel so much hate toward my parents? Why did I have such a strong need to get away from 18 years of my childhood to start fresh somewhere else? The podcast answered all of my questions. It even answered questions I didn't know I had. I kid you not, realizing what I'd stumbled upon was like having my eyes open for the first time. Class was never the same after that, and neither was life. I dropped out at the end of my first year and moved to Austin, where the podcast was based. I wanted to put everything they taught me into practice. I never doubted my ability to figure it all out. Despite having only $3,000 in the bank and never having held a full-time job before, I wasn't afraid. I was excited. I didn't care that my parents thought I was crazy. They were the crazy ones. Everyone who thought that this was wrong for me was crazy. I became the only person I needed to listen to. And man, was I good at it. Anyway... Nat and I arrive at book people, and all of a sudden my arms are shaking. I see the book first thing when I walk inside. 
about a hundred hardcover copies neatly displayed on wooden shelves. I go up to the lady at the checkout counter and get my copy. Second floor to the left, the lady says. You'll see it. Matt holds my hand as we walk up the stairs and asks if I'm nervous. Kind of, yeah. It's going to be fine, she says. She kisses my hand and adds, I'll be right next to you the whole time. I look at her and the nerves go away. All I'm thinking about now is how sweet she is to me, how beautiful she looks tonight, and how lucky I am to be holding her hand. Thank you, I tell her. I love you. I love you too. Matt and I find a seat near the back and watch as the room fills with Book in a Box employees, or tribe members, as they call each other. Tucker arrives with his wife and newborn baby girl. JT arrives wearing a blue checkered, long sleeved dress shirt and black slacks. I notice a big fucking watch on his left wrist. The way they all hang out together is so warm and relaxed that I can't help but feel at ease. One of the older men I recognize from the company's about section comes up to me and says, Hey there, my name's Hal. We shake hands. Nick, I say. This is my girlfriend, Nat. It's a pleasure to meet you both, a beat. How did y'all hear about the book? Oh, well, I'm a huge fan of Book in a Box and the work you guys do. I was really excited when I heard about the signing. You don't say. Have you applied for a position before? Yeah, but I'm like still pretty young, so I don't expect I'll be hired anytime soon. I immediately wish I could take the words back. Now why would they hire me? This guy must think I'm a dope. How old are you? 21. One of our brightest tribe members is 22. He leads a team of about five or six people. So don't let age discourage you. Keep applying. I will. Thanks. After the talk, I walk up to the desk where JT is signing copies. He shakes my hand and doesn't break eye contact. He thanks Nat and I for coming tonight. Then he signs my book. Don't ever stop hustling. Day 76. Recently, I convinced Nat to sign up for a membership at my gym. She took a couple of trial classes and got a lot out of it. Her kicks were mean. Now we go together as often as we can, and I think it's been helping repair our relationship. Being able to hold pads for each other while we punch and kick the shit out of them allows both of us to release a lot of built-up frustration. We go back to my place after every class, shower, eat dinner, and then watch TV till we fall asleep. A lot of times we'll have crazy sex in the shower, or we'll go down on each other right after it, all clean and fresh. Nat has even started going to classes without me. She's so strong and built for this kind of activity. Both of us are getting in much better shape because of it, too, and I see how healthy it all is. Staying fit despite your relationship, I mean, because I feel like a lot of the times I'll just kind of cruise, you know? I'm a pretty slim dude, and I'm also a tall son of a bitch, so I can go years without exercise and I'll look mostly the same. But I won't feel the same, because getting to practice three or four times a week and really push myself to places I've never been before boosts my testosterone and makes me feel so much more engaged with life. I got paired with this Irish dude the other day that was taller than me. He was training for an actual fight, and you could see it in his arms and legs and just his attitude, like he wore a hoodie throughout most of class because it helped him somehow. It had been a couple weeks since he first showed up, his kicks the hardest anyone had ever seen. I was probably second or third on the list, so Bernardo, my trainer, put me to the test. His first kick knocked the wind out of me. It was one of those double kicks in quick succession, so really it knocked the wind out of me twice. I bent down and rested my elbows on my knees, water in my eyes. Class wasn't even ten minutes in, and already I felt like I needed to go home and sleep for ten days. Come on, Nick the Irish dude yelled at me. Gotta keep moving, mate. You can do it. He helped me bring my pads up, and as soon as I did, he kicked me three times and knocked the wind out of me again. Bernardo noticed me struggling and asked if I was doing okay. I could tell he was enjoying watching this. I'm okay, I lied. Go again. This time I held the pads through the kick and only felt the bone in my forearms crack a little. But I didn't falter. I let Nick continue to slaughter me for another 15 minutes. By the end of it, I was on the mats, lying on my back, watching people step over me and ask if I was okay. This time I didn't bother answering. All right, Bernardo yelled. Switch it up. I had completely forgotten that it was my turn next. Where was I to find the energy to even stand up, let alone fight this beast? Come on, Nick said. Just a few more rounds, all right? I got onto my feet and strapped my gloves on. I think what kept me going was knowing that at the end of the session, I'd no longer be afraid to spar with anyone in the gym, besides not wanting to let Bernardo down, of course. After class, I dragged myself to my bicycle and started sobbing. I was a sweaty, smelly mess with tears dripping from my chin. Sadness wasn't the reason. 
I just never really had someone believe in me the way Bernardo did. It was such a beautiful feeling, and I burned out fighting Nick, so there was nothing left in me to fight the tears. Anyway, Nat and I are on our way to a concert when all of these thoughts start creeping in. Things feel better even though they shouldn't. That's what my therapist tells me. You've been thinking about breaking up with her for a while now. Do you still think there's ever going to be a right time? I don't know, I just can't do it before Valentine's Day, can I? I mean, we have that Lemon Twigs concert she's so excited about. Don't you think that'll make breaking up harder? I'm worried about you, not her. I'm worried you might be doing damage to yourself by being with someone you don't really want to be with. Things have been better, though. And even if Alex doesn't think so, there's no denying that they have. We only fight, like, once or twice a week, sometimes less. Also, I'm too much of a romantic to pass up this opportunity. It's all planned out and everything. But that doesn't mean I still can't be thinking the same shit I've been thinking for months now. That it needs to end. I'm just deciding to focus my energy on someone else for once. I'm tired of all this bullshit self-reflection. I'm tired of trying so damn hard to do what's right. Why can't I just be my age and act my age? I got criticized when I was younger for trying to act older than I was. So why not embrace where I'm at right now? I feel excited to be on a date with her for the first time in a long time. I'm not just thinking about going home so we can fuck. I actually want to be at the venue holding her hips and resting my chin on her head as we listen to my new favorite band. We sing and dance together. We make out. We whisper sweet things in each other's ears. And still, my mind tells me that it's all wrong. Fake. A front. But this time I engage with the thought. I respond, and I tell it that if this is what wrong feels like, I'm quite alright with that. Then we just kind of let the world around us disappear and tune in to each other in the band. Each other in the band. Day 112. I'm at another Lemon Twigs concert, alone this time. They're recording a Spotify session next to Moody Theater, and two free tickets ended up on my lap from a coworker who couldn't make it. I had enough time to invite Nat, but didn't. I'm trying a new approach, one that doesn't involve us doing every single thing together all the time. Really, I just wanted to get away from her and rediscover what it's like to move through the world without someone there to hold my hand. I mean, I haven't even reached two years in Austin, and already I'm tied down to someone? There's just no way that's what I came here for, but I'm too scared to break it off, so instead I came to the show hoping I won't leave by myself. Nat and I aren't in the middle of a fight or anything. I'm just an asshole who thinks he can get away with anything. I've been thinking about other girls since before the new year. What it would be like to go on dates again and browse through all the dating apps. Who am I kidding? I've been browsing Bumble for a solid month now, matching with all kinds of girls but never really asking them out because that's where I draw the line. I tell myself there's nothing wrong with browsing as long as I don't actually reach out to them, even though it's up to the girls to reach out to me on this app and plenty of them have already. Man, I'm so full of shit I can smell it when I wake up every goddamn day. All of my life I got away with things I shouldn't have. I cheated on my high school girlfriend multiple times. I got handcuffed by police, but never went to holding. I snuck into hotels and ate their food for free. I cheated on just about every homework and exam I ever took. It's gotten to the point where I almost know I'm never going to get caught. Now I'm just realizing how empty it all makes me feel. There's no pride in any of it. But I'm too far down the rabbit hole to stop. So even when Nat's friends pop up on my apps, I just close the app and hope I won't show up on theirs. Even if I do, I already have excuses lined up for what I could tell Nat, like, I deleted it, but maybe I forgot to deactivate my account. I changed the password on my phone, too, in case she tries to be sneaky. It's all worked out in my head, and nobody can fucking stop me. The temptation is so in control that sometimes when Nat's friends pop up, I think, what if I swipe right? Maybe they wouldn't care. Maybe they would want to cheat on their friend. It wouldn't be the first time that happened to me. They're all so damn beautiful, I want to fuck every last one of them. I just don't want to go home alone when I'm done. If it happens at this concert, though, I'd be alright with it. I wouldn't have to worry about Nat finding out. So I dress in a way that makes me look good. Not my usual sweatpants and ratty t-shirt. I'm in dark corduroys and a black t-shirt because that's how I'm feeling inside. It's also what my life needs right now. Darkness. All this working out and eating healthy and having great sex is boring. Inside the venue is small. Cozy small. There are couches and cocktail tables with cushioned seats around them. All of it set up around the stage so that everyone has a first class view. Only one of the two bars is open, but I don't get a drink because I'm broke. I just sit on one of the couches and hope some cute girls sit next to me. Instead, 
One mildly attractive girl and her ugly friend sit on the couch with me. They immediately start talking to me about the band. So I'm friendly and I make conversation. We got these tickets for free. Do you know if the band is any good? The ugly one asks. Oh yeah, they're great. If you've never heard of them before, you're in for a fun time. Are you from here? The other one asks. I live here, yeah, but I'm from Mexico. What about you girls? You look like you're on vacation. They smile and sort of giggle together. We drove up from San Antonio, or down? I don't know. I always mix up north and south. We're only here for two more nights, though. Oh, so you know Austin. I thought maybe it was your first time. Yeah, we come here all the time, mainly for concerts. What's your name? Lydia. And this is Patty. I shake Lydia and Patty's hands. I'm Nick. It's good to meet you both. You too. We're meeting my boyfriend on Dirty after this if you're not doing anything. I see Patty's ears perk up. Yeah, I say. I don't want to hurt Patty's feelings, but Lydia was the one I wanted, and she's taken. That sounds fun. But still, I lie. Even though I have no intention of meeting up with them, I'm too weak to say no. The band comes out and starts chatting up the room, all 50 of us. I pull out my phone and start taking pictures, recording videos and voice notes, texting Nat and a couple of other friends about the show. Nat's jealous that I'm here without her. She doesn't know I have an extra ticket because her possible reaction to that scares the living hell out of me. I don't think there's anything wrong with coming alone, but after her blow up before the camping trip, I just can't be sure she'll agree with me, so I lie. I lie to her about the show. I lie to the girls about meeting up with them. I lie to my friends about how happy and excited I am to be at the show. I lie to myself about what I'm doing. I make up excuses for my lies. And if I start to feel bad for any of it, I smoke some weed and keep on lying to people. Because hey, man, all my favorite authors were good-for-nothing scumbags. Why can't I be that way too? I'll put in the work when I'm older. All I need right now is some goddamn freedom. Day 122. About a week later, a third concert rolls around. The Growlers, a band that my store manager recommended, plays tonight at Emo's, a huge venue just five minutes from my apartment. This time I did tell Nat about it. We've had plans to go see them together for almost six months now. My buddy Ernesto and his girlfriend Becky are also fans, so an hour before the show, they invite us to Ernesto's apartment to smoke. I'm carrying some inner tension because I don't really smoke in front of Nat, and I'm worried she might want to get high, worried about exposing her to weed when she's told me in the past that she shouldn't smoke it. But I'm also trying to control things less and just kind of let them happen, you know? It's fucking hard letting everyone have fun instead of always trying to make the right decision for them. My version of that is to tell Nat what we're walking into beforehand and gauge where she's at with it. It's fine if I smoke a little every now and then, she says. Don't worry, honey. Are you sure? I mean, we can also just meet them at the venue. Don't be silly. We're almost there. Besides, I'm going to be with you all night. If I start feeling weird or anything, I'll let you know. We walk up the stairs to Ernesto's second floor apartment, just down the block from my place. I knock on the door. He opens up and hugs me, then hugs Nat. Becky introduces herself, and then we all find a seat on an L-shaped couch that Rocco, Ernesto's dog, has made himself comfortable on. So where are y'all from? Nat asks. We're actually both from the same place. Do you know McAllen? No way! I'm from Edinburgh. Oh shit! So all three of us were like neighbors growing up? Ernesto hands me the blunt and coughs. Didn't you go there recently? He asks me. I hit the blunt and hope it'll make the question easier to answer. All I say is, yeah, last Thanksgiving. Becky asks, did you go to the beach? South Padre, I say. Yeah, Nat told me we couldn't miss it. Then to Ernesto, you know what it reminded me of? He asks what with his face as I hit the blunt again. I offer it to Nat because she's next in the circle, but I feel terrible that this is how it turned out. Not only did I put her in this situation, I was literally the one who handed it to her and said, Do you want some? She takes it in her hands and knows exactly what she's doing. I forget she has a whole hippie history with it. I watch her cough and my two puffs start to hit me because Ernesto's weed always gets me. She looks sexy in a way I had yet to experience. Dangerous sexy. Like there's a whole world she knows of that I don't. A rush of adrenaline fills my limbs and now I haven't a care in the world. I mean... I'm a little in my head because this group of people has never hung out together, but I'm always a little in my head. I'm just happy I'm not acting all dad-like about Nat smoking anymore. She totally has it under control. Hell, 
It even looks like it's helping her relax and enjoy herself. What's wrong with that? The nervousness slowly dissipates. I start to feel cool, dangerous like Nat, like I'm proud to have friends that can smoke me and my girlfriend out. And Nat probably feels the same way, at least in my mind. What does it remind you of? Ernesto asks, annoyed it's taken me so long to get to the point. Oh shit, I laugh. Right, it reminds me of a smaller version of the hotel zone in Cancun. Just the layout. I don't know. Ernesto laughs as his eyes dart back and forth from me to Becky's phone. Becky is on it, texting someone, and I guess Ernesto doesn't trust her because he looks like he's boiling up inside. He looks like I have felt before, so of course he's tripping out, thinking that his girl is cheating on him. The mind can fuck with you in ways that make you act like a completely different person. Jealousy, among young men, is the hardest of all mind fucks to have an objective outlook on, especially as Mexicans. I mean, we're taught growing up not to let anyone fuck with us. We have to be macho and strong and always stay one step ahead of people, a kind of trust no one mentality. Who are you texting? He asks her. Jealousy has such a stronghold on him right now that he completely stops engaging with Nat and me to the point where we start our own conversation, trying to break some of the tension. My friend Liza's going out to Dirty tonight. She's just asking if I want to go. What did you say? I haven't given her an answer. Why not? I haven't made up my mind, dude. Chill. Chill? You're making plans to go get fucked up after the show, and you're telling me to chill? Okay, I never said that. Ernesto turns to me and says, Yo, you guys ready to go? Y'all want to walk there together? I don't, and I know Nat doesn't either. Sure, I say, and stand up. Let's do it. They continue to argue the entire walk over. Nat and I giggle and talk about our favorite Growlers songs. A cool breeze moves past us. It's weird how being around a toxic couple makes me feel like Nat and I aren't that bad. The feeling intensifies when we get in line at Emo's. It's not a line as much as it is a cluster of people, all trying to push through to get to the security checkpoint. Becky says she'll be right back and just sort of disappears into the crowd. Ernesto puts on a brave face like it doesn't bother him that his girl just left him. Then he calls her and starts yelling into the phone. Nat and I try to figure out what the hell is going on with them, but as soon as we get inside, we forget they even came with. We're holding on to each other so tightly that I know she can feel how hard I am. The band's not even out yet, but we're dancing to the tunes they play before the show. A small part of me is self-conscious about my dancing, but Nat and I don't let go of each other, so I let go of that worry instead. I turn her to face me and we start making out. I don't know how much time passes before we stop, but we stop because the lights dim and the band's walking out song starts playing. Nat woos and claps and I start doing the same, my hands around her hips. The growlers, I think. The fucking growlers. One by one, they find their place on stage, letting Brooks Nielsen come out last. And when he does, the crowd erupts and my adrenaline spikes. All that matters now is that Nat and I are having fun, kissing and touching each other, singing along together, dancing, and we're not fighting outside the venue, like I learned through texts that Ernesto and Becky are. We're not as fucked up as they are, and they're still together. Maybe there's a chance for us after all. Day 140. Three weeks later, I squander whatever chance was left. I'm in a parking garage changing out of my work clothes into date-worthy attire because I'm supposed to meet this chick Mabel at the coffee shop next door. I finally caved on Bumble. Mabel messaged me and seemed eager to meet, and well, I did what I knew I was going to do all along. I set up a date, and now I'm here. As I make my way inside Dominican Joe's coffee shop, I think of all the people that could recognize me and tell Nat about this. But then I think, so what if they recognize me? Nobody knows we're on a date. Mabel might as well be a co-worker. So the worrying subsides. Then Mabel arrives and finds me sitting on a picnic table in the outside patio. She's a little overweight, but her clothes are tight enough and her hair is blonde, so I'm fooled into thinking she's everything I'm missing in my life right now. We hug and then sit across from one another. I ask her about her day. She tells me about her classes at St. Edward's University. Goes through the whole... This is what I'm studying, and this is why I chose Austin's speech. But it's more like Austin chose her. Her dad was in banking until the financial crisis of 08, and became a computer programmer after it. Then brought his family to Austin so he could start a job for Dell. Literally anything she says right now will spark my curiosity, because I'm so damn excited to be on a first date again. It doesn't matter that I know I'd never seriously date Mabel because of her weight, or that I'm acting like a complete fucking sociopath just by being here. Nobody knows, so as long as I don't think of myself that way, 
Who cares, right? When she goes to the bathroom, I check in with my phone, with Nat. I pretend I've gone about my day as usual, tell her I'm home and about to hop in the shower. Having to account for where I am and what I'm doing at all times is one of the reasons I'm miserable in that relationship. So being here is kind of a way to say fuck you to all of that. I hate needing a reason. I've hated it all my life. In high school, I used to ask friends to text me as if they were my stepmom so that I could leave early and go home to watch the Champions League games. Why was school holding me captive if I didn't want to be there? It's like I've been conditioned to do shit I didn't want to do. Go to class. Do your homework. Visit your mom over break. Go back to school after break. Don't wear hats on school grounds. Come in clean shaven or go home. Apply to college. Get in. Go to college. None of that was my choice. I mean, sure, I could have run away from home and tried to fend for myself at 13, but what did that ever do for my dad when he did it? My parents never sat me down to have a conversation about any of this. They were too busy taking care of themselves under the guise that it was also I could have a roof over my head and food on the table and hot showers. I was trying so hard to fail at everything because no one listened to me when I told them the truth. I don't want to be in school right now. I can't be in school right now. I sit in class and my mind starts going thousands of miles an hour. Teachers will assign work that needs to be turned in at the end of class and I'll find ways to make my friends laugh instead. Nobody wants their kid telling them that. But why? Because it's all bullshit. None of it is about the kid. It's all about the parents, or the school's reputation, or showing your teachers respect by fighting your true nature. All of it just so everyone else can be happy and judgment free. Fuck. It makes me want to rebel more every time I think about it. Like anyone who becomes close to me will get fucked over somehow because no one is to be trusted. If someone says they love me, they must be trying to get me to do some shit I don't want anything to do with. Once you reach a certain level of intimacy, my self-defense mechanisms sprout and figure out ways to keep you at a safe distance. And right now, Nat's the one I'm defending myself from. Mabel doesn't know shit about me. She doesn't know that I cheated on my high school girlfriend, that I've been sexual with more guys than I have girls, that I come from a broken family, that I move through the world with my anger at a constant six or seven, one minor confrontation away from blowing up to a ten. And because of that, Mabel is someone I actually want to spend time with. I can be whoever I want to be with her, so I choose to be the person I wish I was. Cooler. More outgoing. The kind of person people think I am because of my looks, without the douchebag part. Besides, Mabel's 19, so the whole age thing I always run into where I act like a fucking child around older girls isn't present. I feel safe, still excited, but safe and in control. I finished telling her a story about a time I almost got arrested in Cancun for smoking weed with my buddies. She thinks it's scary and cool and asks a bunch of questions. Then she uses a napkin to wipe sweat from her forehead and says, It's so hot outside. Would you maybe want to go inside somewhere? Did you drive here? It is hot, isn't it? She nods and makes a face. I actually don't own a car, I say, feeling no shame in it. I rode my bike here. Oh no, do you need a ride home? I can take you. Uh, nah. I don't want to put you through that right now. There's a bus stop right outside that drops me off in front of my place. But thank you, really. And thanks for grabbing coffee with me, even if we didn't actually get anything to drink. It's been so fun. I'm glad we did. We make our way to her car to say goodbye. What's your number, she asks. If you're not doing anything this weekend, me and a few of my friends are hanging out on Saturday night. I'd love it if you came. Uh, yeah. That sounds fun, I say. I give her my number and take hers down. I'll text you before then so we can confirm. Does that sound good? Mabel smiles and says, Sounds great. We hug and she gets in her car, rolls the windows down. Good luck on your ride home. Then she backs out and drives away. I find my bike and sit next to it at the bus stop, waiting. Waiting. Waiting for the bus to come and save me. Day 143. Mabel and her friend Anna pick me up in a blue Suburban. It's nighttime, and Nat has no idea where I am. She thinks I'm just at home on my computer, or asleep, or something, because we're not texting. The blue Suburban takes us somewhere on South Lamar, a sports bar under these luxury apartments. We meet five or six more people inside the bar, though we end up sitting outside. I buy Mabel and her friend Anna their drinks because I'm the only 21-year-old. It's cool being the oldest and feeling the oldest. Besides... They're all, like, a couple months away from being 21, so it's not like I'm buying booze for teens. 
Mabel's wearing a black leather jacket and red lipstick and it all makes her blonde hair really pop, pop, pop. I'm sitting next to her, her arm wrapped around mine, and I'm wearing an outfit I've gotten too lazy to wear around Nat. Jeans and a black t-shirt. Three blonde, sweater-wearing assholes sit to my left and watch a football game that is on so loud it makes hearing harder. But I focus on Mabel and her friends. I'm different around them than I am around my friends. Or Nat, even. I see more of my high school self come out. DeMarcus thinks he's got my pussy on lockdown, girl, her friend Cindy says. Like, he's going through my phone and doing all kinds of crazy shit. Like, I can't be texting you and be sleeping with other guys? For real, nigga? Then why are you still talking to him, I ask. It's the first thing I've said in a couple of minutes, so everyone kind of stops and takes that in. I mean, this guy doesn't sound like what you want, does he? You're right, she says. I don't actually know why I'm talking to him. In fact, I'm going to tell him we're done right now. Mabel raises an eyebrow at me like, is she really about to do that? All of her friends do the same. But Cindy doesn't stop. She really is about to do that, and I have mixed feelings about it. On one hand, it sounds pretty abusive, but on the other, I don't know shit. After drinks, Mabel and I drop Anna off at her apartment on St. Edward's campus. Do you want to come over, Mabel asks? Let's do it. I have some weed we can smoke if you want to. Hell yeah. And smoke some weed we do. Four bowls from her bong. My roommate never leaves her room. It's like I live alone most of the time. Do you like living alone? I mean, it's whatever, you know. I think she's just upset because I left the trash bag next to the back door or something. She leaves all these passive-aggressive notes everywhere. Look! She points at one on the refrigerator. I think that one was because I didn't do the dishes on Laura time. She sounds hard to live with. I guess. Mabel stares at me and I stare back. We've been sitting on our living room couch for about two hours now. It must be one or two in the morning. Do you want a dab? She asks. I know what she's talking about only because my friend Ernesto and I have smoked dabs together before. They're in my room, she says as she stands up. Come here. I follow her into the bedroom and find a comfortable spot on her bed while she puts it all together. Smoking a dab with her right now isn't really what I want to do, but I know it'll help me fuck her longer, so I don't fight it. Besides, I put myself in this situation by not making a move earlier. When I finally do, she responds like she'd been hoping it would happen for hours. Her tongue fights mine and her teeth draw blood from the inside of my lower lip. She turns me over and gets on top of me. We undress as her legs rub against mine. It all happens so fast I don't even stop to think about Nat. Do you want to fuck me, Mabel asks? I'm going to fuck you. She grabs a hold of me and slides me inside of her without putting a rubber on. I can't believe what's happening. There's a rush filling all of my voids. I don't care that my family fucking sucks or that I'm in a relationship I should have left months ago. None of it matters because I'm inside of Mabel and it feels so damn good. Her tongue moves in ways that Nat's doesn't. Despite being three years younger than Nat, Mabel feels so much more sexual. Or liberated. I don't know. We fuck like caged animals and tear at each other's skin. She digs her nails into my back and scratches all the way down to my ass, five lines forming under my skin that feel like they're on fire. I slap her ass hard and loud and leave marks all over. What feels like an hour goes by and we're still fucking. Only now we're drenched with sweat, slipping on the wet covers and really trying to show each other how turned on we are. I flip her on her stomach and take her from behind. I don't know if I'm supposed to pull out or what the assumption is, but I feel myself getting close and it tickles my insides and fogs my mind, and before too much back and forth I'm coming inside of her hard, so hard I'm not even worried about it. The feeling is new because I've only ever used condoms before. It's like there's no fighting against, just truly allowing release to happen. And when it's done and we lie down, I get hard again at the thought of my cum dripping out of her. The infidelity. The power and control that being the only one who knows about this gives me. Doesn't hurt yet because I've been so unhappy for so damn long and I'm just ready to feel a little bit better. I mean, I know it's fucked up. Like, lying next to Mabel, naked. I know if it were the other way around and Nat was fucking some random dude, I would be crushed. Not broken hearted. Fucking devastated. But, it's not. And being with Mabel, well, it might be exactly what I need right now. I've been looking for an excuse to break up with Nat, and now I finally have one. Not only that, but I won't have to be alone all the time either. I can leave Nat and see out this thing with Mabel. Just without all the talk about feelings, of course. You know I'm not looking for anything serious right now, don't you? Yeah, of course, I say. Shocked at how in sync we are. That's totally fine. 
but I still want to see you. You will. Maybe sometime this week, I ask, planning ahead to when I'll be single. We can figure it out later. She kisses me. Right now I want you to fuck me again. So I do. And it's magical. And for the rest of the night I keep telling myself it'll all be just fine. Fine, just fine. I wake up with Mabel holding my arm, her eyes closed. Both of us are naked. Her room is a perfect metaphor for how my brain feels. There is clutter everywhere. Mostly clothes and shoes. Some art. But because I'm so removed from myself it kind of turns me on. Mabel must feel the sheets moving as my erection grows because her hand slides down my arm and grabs a hold of my cock. She plays with it for a minute before going under the covers and putting me in her mouth. I'm groggy and disoriented. I ignore the guilt and sadness that's waiting to burst from my chest and focus instead on how crazy it feels to be inside her like this. And before I can really let myself fall into relaxation, she climbs on top of me and brings me inside again. Her eyes remain closed as she rides me, like it doesn't matter who it is that's inside her. All that matters is how good she feels. For some reason, I associate the image with that of a strong, independent woman. Then I feel myself getting close, and though I've come inside her twice already, I worry about the possibility of getting a stranger pregnant. Only now I'm not stoned out of my mind, so I don't have a problem asking her if she's on birth control. She laughs, nods her head, then gets off of me and onto all fours. I want you to fuck me like a dog, she says. Then you can come inside me. Afterwards, Mabel insists on driving me home, but I'm not going home. I have therapy, and I'm not ready for her to know that about me, so I tell her she's already done too much and call an Uber instead. As I get dressed, I watch her take two pills out of her nightstand and down them with water. I want to ask her about them, but I don't because I'm afraid to. She catches me looking at her and says, I have seasonal depression. Oh, I say. Great. Another girl with a mental disorder. I'm sorry. Then I leave. So how was your week? How are you feeling today? Alex asks. Uh, not great. I, uh, I think I need to break up with Nat. Okay, she nods. I went on a date this Wednesday. I came from her place, actually. I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time following. Who did you go on a date with? Her name is Mabel. I met her online. Alex writes in her notebook. We had sex last night. And this morning, too. Okay, she nods again, but Nat doesn't know about this yet. No. Okay. That's okay. Do you mind walking me through it a little bit more? Yeah. We got coffee after work, then she invited me out with her friends on Saturday, so I got a few drinks with them and it just kinda went from there. We went back to her place and smoked a lot of weed and, uh, had sex. Did you use protection? No. I can tell it upsets her when I say that. And this morning? It was all pretty fast. We woke up, had sex, then I came here. Did you use protection then? No. How do you feel about that? I mean, she's a well-off girl. I'm not worried about disease or anything like that. And she said she's on birth control, so like, that's all good. Are you feeling anything else about it? I feel sad. Frustrated. Like... I know it's not okay. That's why I have to break up. Have you thought about what you're going to say? Definitely not this. I don't think she needs to find out if it's over, do you? I'm a little worried that it took things getting to this point for you to make that decision. What does that bring up for you? I know. It bothers me too. I'm making all the same mistakes I made in high school. At least this time I'm breaking up though, you know? Like. I don't feel that bad, because if I break up with her today, it's not the same as staying in it for another year, knowing that I cheated on her. You do understand the health risks, right? I guess. I just feel like I'd know if a girl had something. Besides, Nat and I use condoms, so there's not a huge risk there. Alex explains the intricacies of STDs to me and lectures me on why cheating poses a threat to your partner's health. How it's not just about the emotional damage, but the potential physical damage, too. I feel like leaving her office and never coming back. I'm so sick of being told I'm wrong and feeling like I'm messing up that abandoning my therapist somehow seems like it would fix things. I think it's important that you hear that, she says. But I do agree with you about what you want to tell her. I don't think she needs to know about this if your relationship is over. I think it could potentially cause more damage than is necessary. But you do have to break up. I know, I say, and burst into tears. 
I cry for a full minute before Alex stops me to ask how I'm feeling, as if it's not obvious. I feel hopeless. For the longest time I thought this was behind me. I want to be responsible and treat people the way they deserve to be treated. It's just also fucking hard. I hate my job. I ruined my relationship. I cheated again. I'm smoking weed on the regular to numb myself. I'm pretty much doing everything wrong. And nobody knows. And sometimes I think about being single and having sex with whoever I want, whenever I want, and not having to worry about what someone else thinks. Maybe I could meet up with guys and date girls, as long as I'm honest with everyone. I don't know. I cry harder after saying that. Alex tries to deconstruct what I said, but at this point I'm no longer listening. I'm hearing the words coming out of her mouth, but I'm in full self-destruct mode, waiting for tomorrow night after work, when I'll be single and on my knees for someone who really wants me. Someone who can tell me what I really am. A worthless little slut that's only good at sucking daddy's cock. Right now that's all I can think of. Do you want to make love to me one last time? Nat says, wiping tears from her eyes and kissing me at the same time. I know what Alex would want me to say, so I know what the right thing to do is. But seeing Nat so sad is just too damn much. I can't hurt her more than I already have. If she wants me to fuck her one last time, that's the least I can do. Yeah, I kiss her harder. I put my hands all over her and start to undress her. I don't want you to wear a condom, she tells me. Just pull out. Okay. So we have sex one last time, just like she asked. I pull out and come on her chest. I tell her I love her. She says it back. Then we move sloppily to the bathroom and clean up our mess, laughing a little as we do. Nervous laughter because by now I think it's starting to sink in with both of us how close the end is. As soon as I leave her apartment, we'll officially be broken up. And I know I'll want to text her. And I know she'll want to text me. We're still going to be friends, right? She asks. I run my hand over her fat orange cat, Biscuit. Of course we will. You're my best friend. You're my best friend too. We'll still talk. And who knows? Maybe in time we can even hang out again. I'd like that. That makes me feel a little bit better about you leaving. That void of deep sadness I carry becomes louder with each promise I make her. Why am I doing this? I told myself I was going to break up and move on. I cheated. I don't deserve to have her in my life in any capacity unless I come clean and allow her to be involved in the decision as well. It's okay to be sad, I say, but you can always text me, and if you ever need someone, I can be there for you, even if it's late at night or you feel like it's inappropriate. If you truly need someone, I can still be that someone for you. We kiss. We kiss again, longer this time. All right, I'll let you go home now. I love you. The tears happen simultaneously for us. We're not ready for what lies ahead. How could we be? I love you too, she says. I'll talk to you later. Okay. I leave her apartment and walk to the bus stop, crying like I just heard about a family member's death or something. The bus picks me up. I sit near the back, pull up my hoodie, and rest my head against the window. That way no one can see me crying. A heavy rain comes down. It drowns out my already muffled sobs. Almost instinctively, my hand reaches for my phone. Nat texted, I love you. I swipe my arm across my face to get rid of the tears and see my keyboard clearly. I text her back, I love you too. Okay, so I, I, I couldn't help but notice how when I was talking to my therapist in this chapter, I was focusing on a lot of right and wrong, a lot of how other people will feel or be affected by what I was doing. And that that's a way that I, I was very disconnected from my emotions. And to this day, it's still, it's still the thing that I have to work on the most because if I am if I am disconnected from my emotions, that means that I have an easier time rationalizing bad behavior because it's less about how I feel than it is about can I find a reason for this to be okay in my head? Can I build a narrative that is solid enough for me to justify doing this thing that will hurt another person? And back then, it was my narrative was I am not, 
I don't love myself and I'm not a good enough, I'm not a good individual. Um, I am somebody that hurts other people. And so that is what I would then go and do because it wasn't about how do I feel, which is sad and lonely and hurt and it was er, and confused and it became more um what do those feelings say about me and and what i what i interpreted at the time was what i just said you know i am not worthy so why would i act like i am and it's important to know this i guess because a lot of young men are very disconnected from their emotions and so when they make decisions, they're not really deciding for what they want and what they feel. They're looking at it like a math equation and trying to just what is the answer that makes the most sense, right? And sometimes when we're experiencing emotional pain and instability, what makes the most sense in our head can be to avoid more pain even though that might make another person hurt more you know by avoiding pain you're you're basically delaying pain but in the moment it can feel like i i am avoiding it so i'm not going to feel it right i'm just uh it, it's a ration, rationalization and you know i don't the way that I've combated this now in my present or adjusted this is by revisiting some of that pain from my childhood and allowing myself to to build a new narrative. You know, okay, yes, I do feel hurt because I was alone for most of my childhood and I didn't have a lot of guidance. I didn't have a lot of unconditional love. But does that mean that I am unlovable and that I am alone? Or does that just mean that my parents also didn't have those things? And and sort of allowing myself to accept that it wasn't about me. It was about them so that I can start to... To, to, I can stop living my present like I was still in my past because that's what a lot of us, most people are just reliving trauma from their past without knowing that that's what they're doing. You know, the reason that you get really upset when somebody doesn't put your coffee mug back where you like to put it might have nothing to do with that other person or with your coffee mug. It might be because when you were a small kid, your parents never let you decide where things went in your bedroom. And so now that triggers that memory for you because you haven't allowed yourself to process it. And so that's just one of the ways that I that I see myself healing is by by going back and and first first building the narrative for what it actually was not for what we want it to be so that it can serve us in our present and then once you accept that taking what you've learned and using it to reframe your present experiences day 145 Work today has been so slow and depressing, I can't help but text her. I also have been feeling like such a fucking idiot for breaking up with her, because all I want now is to be with her again. The voice in my head has never been stronger. It says, if you can get her to take you back, I promise all of the pain will go away. So I guess that's the real reason I text her. I think I made a mistake. She gets back to me two hours later because I text her that at 7.30 in the morning. What do you mean? Work gets busier, but I text back regardless. Adrenaline forces me to. I've been so sad lately, dealing with a lot of difficult emotions, that I think I panicked and thought I had to do it all by myself, when really, I should have let you in, because that's what being in a relationship is all about. I feel so stupid for texting you this right now. 
I don't expect you to feel the same way or to want to get back together because obviously it must be confusing getting this text from me just a day after I broke up with you. But I feel so strongly that I made a mistake and I had to let you know because I love you, Nat. I'm in love with you. My palms sweat when the red receipt appears. There it is. It's done. I've put it all on the table. Now it's her call. I don't know. I love you too, but why should I believe you? How do I know you're not just saying that? More and more people come into the store. There couldn't possibly be a worse time to multitask, especially with something as fragile as my relationship. But I have to find a way to make both work, so I run to the back every five seconds and type some more into my phone, hoping the text doesn't come out as fragmented as it feels. You shouldn't, and I completely understand if you don't. But I wouldn't lie to you. It's so clear to me now that we should be together. But I broke up with you, so if I can't get my shit together, you shouldn't have to put up with me. I'm not asking you to give me an answer right now. I just wanted you to know how I really feel, because it all makes so much more sense to me now. It's after sending that text that I realize how full of shit I am. I don't want to get back together with her. I'm just freaked the fuck out that I'm single and alone, because how can I possibly live my life without her by my side? It wasn't that bad, was it? Having her over for dinner, having sex, how beautiful she is, how good it feels to just be next to her, holding her, touching her soft skin, it all seems so precious now. I want what I can't have. And now that I've seen a glimpse of her potentially taking me back, I feel so stupid for texting her. Okay, I trust you. And I'm so in love with you. I'm so happy that you texted. I miss you so much. My stomach eats at itself from the inside out when I read that. All it took was a few texts to go ten steps back in my life. I have a girlfriend again? Did it ever really feel like I wouldn't? But, fuck. I already had plans to meet up with someone tonight, and just like that my freedom was taken from me, or just like that I gave my freedom away? Now all I want is the opposite of what I got. It's like a twisted fucking game I'm playing with myself, except I'm not the one in control. That's really how it feels, like there are voices guiding me away from what is right, toward doors labeled success, only to be met with failure that compounds every time I open a new one. Nat and I text back and forth a while longer telling each other sweet things, how excited we are to be back together. The entire time I'm thinking to myself, you don't believe a single word you're saying. You're so full of shit, buddy. You deserve to be miserable. So little by little, one thought after the other, I start to believe that about myself. I do deserve to be miserable. And misery deserves me. One of the things that's most confusing to me, that has been most confusing to me my whole life is... When people say, you, in order to heal, you need to just feel your emotions, right? If you don't know how that, what that looks like, then when you hear that, it sounds very abstract. And this chapter is a perfect example of me avoiding my emotions. Because when I broke up with Nat... The reason it took me a while to do it was because there was fear around the emotions that would come up when I wasn't with her, you know. What is she doing? Is she has she started seeing someone someone else already? Does she hate me? Does she think that I'm a bad person? Um does does the fact that we're no longer together mean that I'm unlovable? Am I a bad person because I hurt her or because I'm you know, because I've made this decision that I think is best for myself, for me. And a lot of these things come up, you know, those are just a few. But the feeling of the emotions is that moment when you really want to reach out to the other person. And the reason that you want to reach out to that person is is because by doing that you can then focus your energy on that and you can use that as a mechanism to avoid right so like if let's say you are having a sleepless night instead of pulling out your phone and doing research on why am i having a sleepless night why can't i go to sleep to just sit there with that feeling 
of restlessness and anxiety is to feel your emotions and to not just jump into something else that you can distract yourself with. So for example, like I, I, I couldn't and, and for a long time in my life, once the breakup happened, all of the emotions came up, but I used my rational mind to talk myself out of feeling them. And my rational mind was, I've made a mistake. This person is good. I'm bad. So why would I take something that's good away from me? I'm never going to get that again. And that allows me to not really dig deep into why do I believe that I'm not going to get that again? Why do I believe that I am not worthy of something like what I already was able to um, provide for myself? And so that's just, to me, it's really, you know, I, I, I always struggle to find an answer. Like, what the hell does feeling my emotions mean? You know, what does that look like? And a lot of times it's just sitting with that that need that you tell yourself is a need, which is not of, I need to figure out why I can't go to sleep. I need to convince this person that I've made a mistake and dive back into a painful relationship or you know it could look so many different ways but almost always the way to feel your emotions regarding that situation is just to not do the thing that you really 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 think is going to make you feel better because that's avoiding your emotions is is generally because they are painful and so if something if you're telling yourself, oh well this will make me feel better, that is an indication that you shouldn't do that thing because the emotion that you should be feeling is pain. And you know, even when you know this intellectually, it can still be hard to execute because a lot of times we aren't stronger than our emotions. But it's just something that now that I have a frame of reference for, I thought would be helpful for people reading and listening to this. Day 151. We broke up again yesterday. I guess I should say I broke up with her again because she was the heartbroken one. All she wants is to be with me and I keep bait and switching her. I did it yesterday because I knew having therapy to go to today would make me feel better, as if that's how therapy works. I woke up at 7 and struggled to fall back asleep. I got out of bed and did the only thing strong enough to distract me from the void. I searched the personals ads on Craigslist. Therapy's not for another five hours, so even though the search has taken longer than usual, I'm optimistic that I'll find someone. Men seek men all day long in most of the big U.S. cities like New York, L.A., Vegas, etc. Within the hour, I find several matches and narrow them down by distance. I ghost the ones that don't fit my bus route and sort the rest by age. There are two early 20s candidates and a third, late 30s one. Something about older men satisfies me more, so I choose the latter. He works at the Marriott downtown, near the financial district. I'm supposed to meet him in the second floor bathroom at 11. He says it's the quietest place he can manage. I don't mind the risk of being caught. In fact, it is, perhaps subconsciously, the reason I'm choosing him over the younger men. I'm hard as I leave the apartment, hard on the bus, and hard as I lock my bike and enter the Marriott. Here I am, fresh out of a year-long relationship, the same amount of time it's been since I last engaged with this shameful addiction of mine. I hate resetting the day's since counter, relapsing or whatever, but I'm also thrilled when my adrenaline spikes, each step that brings me closer to the bathroom boosting it even more. Inside the hotel, nobody knows who I am, nor do they care. The place is packed with guests coming and going, bellboys lugging bags to and fro, Parents trying to round up their young for breakfast or brunch. I feel like Agent 47 all stealth and shit, except I'm not here to kill anyone. I check my email and reread the instructions on how to find the bathroom. I take the stairs to the second floor and walk as far away from everyone as possible. I turn a corner, then another, and there it is. The men's bathroom. Not a soul in sight. My hands and arms start trembling with excitement. My teeth clatter. A sudden cold fills me inside and out. Two deep breaths later, I find myself inside the bathroom, acting almost on autopilot. 
Neither one of us knows what the other looks like, so when I see a man leaning his head against the wall in a urinal in the far back, I freak out and lock myself in one of the only two stalls. We are the only ones in here, yet there's a part of me that worries this man might be nothing but an innocent bystander. Because I didn't get a clear instruction on how we are to recognize one another, I wait. One full minute goes by before I hear the man zip his pants and buckle his belt. Footsteps. All of a sudden, he's standing directly outside of my stall, his Oxford dress shoes the only part of him I can see. I unlock the stall and let the door swing gently towards him. It reveals his face, his beard, his smell. He gets in the stall with me and locks the door. Neither one of us says a word as he unbuckles his belt and unzips his pants. I'm just a means to an end for him. I open my mouth and let him inside of it. I wait three minutes for him to come and only a few seconds for him to leave afterward. Familiar feelings wash over me. I needn't describe them this time because I know exactly what I've done and why I've done it. The only missing piece is why I can't stop myself. I spit out most of his cum and flush it down the toilet. Then I rinse out the rest of it from my mouth in one of the hand washing stations. It doesn't taste good at all. I'm repulsed by it, so I put soap in my mouth, gargle, and spit. When I finish, I notice I'm still fully erect and go back to the stall I was just in to rub one out. I always feel like that'll help me feel less, but it never does. It makes me feel worse. And so does my therapist when she questions my motivation for scheduling a breakup and a hookup only hours before our session. She asks if I'm trying to get a reaction out of her. Truth is, I'm just lost in acting out traumas by reacting to everything and everyone, hoping that some strange, mystical man from the deep web can fuck my face so hard that all the sadness and emptiness will go away. Day 153. Nat and I get back together on Tuesday. Day 154. I quit my job on Wednesday. Day 156. We break up again on Friday. This one is so ugly it scares me. Nat is freaking out by my bedroom window, back against the wall because her paranoia has her thinking I'm the enemy. Stay away from me. Don't take one step closer. I'm not going to. I promise. I won't even move. If you want to leave, you can do that too. Not because I want you to, but just so you know that you are in control right now. I would never think about hurting you. It's just your brain playing games with you. Her eyes are big like a scared cat's. She's so afraid of me that I kind of start becoming scared of myself. But it's unprompted. The only thing I can think of that would trigger this is how fucking stupid I've been about considering her feelings. Getting back together so many times only for her to realize that I'm the same selfish asshole. Maybe human nature is telling her I'm an emotionally dangerous person, and all she can see is a hovering splotch of black ink where I'm standing. Get away from him! Get away from him! Is what I imagine her internal thoughts to be saying. She runs alongside the walls of my apartment until she's made it out. Now I'm all alone, but the danger doesn't seem to have left my room because I'm freaking out too. The light in my closet is turned off, and I sense someone hiding in there. I slam the door shut as fast as I can. Whoever was in the closet must have teleported to the living room because that's where I'm looking now, looming death surely approaching. I run fast and close that door too. I fall to the floor with my back against the bed, sweating. There's only one door left and it's to my bathroom, but an urge to pee grabs a hold of me. I pee facing the opposite direction I normally would just so I can keep an eye on the door and have my back against the wall. Then I shut the door and run to bed to get under the covers. I'm going to have to sleep with the lights on tonight, I just know it. Without really thinking about what I'm doing, I call my mom. I sob into the phone as she picks up and says, Oh honey, what is it? What's wrong? I'm freaking out, mom. Nat and I broke up. I think I'm having a panic attack. There is a pause that allows the empathy to be drained from my mom. I need so badly for her to comfort me and tell me that it's okay to be feeling this way. I need her to validate me and my emotions even though my whole life she did the opposite. I have no one else to call. Should we talk about medication? She finally says. It might help. Now I start thinking I'm worthless. My own mom can't take care of me, so why should I? I know that telling her medication is not the answer will go over her head, so I entertain the idea without meaning behind my words. Then I make the mistake of saying, I'm so scared to be alone right now. My thoughts are overpowering and making me afraid of everything. Is Todd home with you? She asks. 
please don't tell him, I say. Or Juliana. I'm okay. I'm just sad, Mom. It might be more than sadness if you're so scared. I think medicine would help. Click. I end the call and get under the covers, my shirt soaked with tears. I feel rejected by everyone, even people I haven't seen in years. I feel misunderstood, and it's such a strong feeling that my mind keeps trying to convince me the only thing that will make it better is if I can somehow change people's minds. The need for validation is fucking crippling me. The last time I remember feeling this way was the night I found my old roommate dead on the floor, half of his body in the bathroom, and half of it in a puddle of smeared shit and oatmeal. I watched Friends that night for comfort, but tonight I am alone.